A law passed in or by Oregon lawmakers back in 2019 just took effect this month. What takes five years to get up and running? Cage-free eggs, of course. Oregon has adopted a rather assertive approach in shutting down small farms and market gardens. They're going to great lengths, including employing satellite technology to locate these farms before dispatching cease and desist notices. Their rationale? Water preservation and safeguarding groundwater. To achieve this, they're leveraging two specific statutes. Let's examine these laws alongside a few instances to understand how they're being implemented to exert pressure on small-scale agriculture. We'll explore the implications of these actions and propose alternative courses of action for the government. So, let's dive into the details. A group of dairy farmers is suing the Oregon Department of Agriculture over a new policy that they say will threaten their small businesses. Starting in April, some small dairies will need to register as confined animal feeding operations, or they could face fines. That process includes creating a plan for wastewater management. In a memo last year, the ODA said some raw milk producers were ignoring the registration requirement. The agency said that this has created environmental concerns, and other dairies have complained about unfair competition. Now some farmers are pushing back. On January 24th, they filed a complaint in federal court, arguing that the requirements don't reflect how small businesses operate. And they accused the state of protecting the corporate milk industry. The lawsuit was first reported by the Statesman Journal. In January 2023, a court case illuminated the collaboration between Oregon's government and the dairy industry against small farmers. As reported by the National Review, Oregon has expanded the definition of CAFOs, confined animal feeding operations, beyond dairy farms. Now, it includes not only small dairy operations, but also structures with chicken coops, goat farms, or any with gravel or concrete floors. So, what exactly constitutes a CAFO in Oregon? According to their definition, it encompasses places where animals are concentrated and fed, including areas for horses, cattle, sheep, or pigs, as well as dairy and poultry facilities, as long as the surface is prepared with concrete, rock, or fibrous material to handle wet weather conditions. This broadened definition has sparked outrage among small-scale farmers, leading to a lawsuit against the state. Now, it's not just about the size of the operation. Even those with just a couple of milking cows are feeling the heat. Consider Sarah King. She's the owner of Godspeed Hollow Farm in Newburgh, a three-cow operation that sells raw milk as a subscription service. King disputes the state's threshold for confinement. Currently, it's defined by a number of days, not by how long an animal spends inside or outside. She said her free-roaming animals would qualify under that criteria, since she brings them in every morning to milk. Milking cows out in the middle of the field in the dark at 5 o'clock in the morning in the middle of January is not pleasant, said King. And so, I really do appreciate being able to bring them into my warm and dry barn to do that even for those 10 or 15 minutes. King says the small amount of waste her animals create is not an environmental hazard, and instead, it fertilizes her land. She's worried that under these regulations, she'll have to buy expensive equipment and undertake extensive data collection. The redefinition of CAFOs has reverberated throughout nearly every aspect of the farming community. This legislation, now enforced in Oregon, has already compelled some farms to cease operations. Fortunately, there's currently a temporary pause on implementing the new definition, courtesy of an injunction filed by the Justice Alliance, which launched a court case in January to contest it. Interestingly, while initial assumptions might imply that this crackdown targets raw milk, its impact extends far beyond that. Egg producers, poultry raisers, anyone with a chicken coop equipped with a concrete floor for easy maintenance is subject to the same scrutiny. The permitting process and substantial requirements are simply overwhelming for many small-scale farmers. This regulation is the primary source of frustration for small farmers, and it remains a focal point in an ongoing legal battle. Now, let's delve into the second regulation which presents a perplexing scenario. In Oregon, if you're tapping into any water reservoir, be it groundwater or otherwise, the sole H2O you're permitted to collect and utilize without bureaucratic hurdles is rainwater. That's right, you heard that correctly. All the valuable liquid concealed beneath your property, according to Oregon statutes, it's not yours. It's deemed public property, regardless of whether you possess a private well. 
Therefore, if you're incorporating it into any commercial endeavor, you best believe you'll require official authorization. But wait, it gets even more intriguing. While this regulation was enacted in 2021, its full ramifications are only just starting to become evident. Small-scale market gardeners with plots as diminutive as half an acre are now being served with cease and desist mandates, effectively compelling them to seek alternative irrigation methods for their crops. However, here's the twist. There's actually a caveat within this regulation for commercial and industrial usage, permitting a daily allocation of up to 5,000 gallons of water. Now, let's contextualize this. Your average half-acre garden likely isn't going to consume anywhere near that volume of water, not even remotely close. So why the stringent enforcement? Even if you're cultivating produce solely for personal consumption, Oregon still places restrictions on the utilization of well water, imposing a cap nonetheless. Now, allow me to share a story about a market garden spanning half an acre, which has fallen victim to these regulations. Introducing Cristina del Campo, the driving force behind Sunburst Fields near Salem. For over a decade, she's been cultivating blueberries, vegetables, and other regional delicacies, supplying them to locals and sustaining herself through their sale. However, she recently received a devastating blow in the form of correspondence from the Oregon Water Resources Department's local office. Essentially, it conveyed a stark message. No water, no harvest. According to Lucy Thompson, the manager for the Southwest region, water is an invaluable asset, and Oregon has regulated its usage through a permit framework since 1909. But here's another twist. That exemption allowing for 5,000 gallons daily? It's exclusively designated for singular commercial or industrial ventures. Therefore, if you have multiple sites, you can't exploit the exemption across the board. Furthermore, the Oregon Water Resources Department explicitly stated that this exemption doesn't encompass irrigation for crops. Consequently, Christina's livelihood, her farm, her source of income, is ensnared in a bureaucratic maze, leaving her in a precarious position. Now let's delve into the details of Oregon's well exemptions. Here's the crux. Nowhere within the regulations does it explicitly state that land irrigation falls outside the scope of coverage. It's fairly straightforward. If you're categorized as a commercial or industrial user, you're eligible to obtain a single-use permit, granting access to up to 5,000 gallons per day, all for a neat $300 fee. However, here's where the narrative veers into the convoluted realm of bureaucracy. Oregon is now rolling out these intrusive monitoring devices to track water usage on individuals' wells, meticulously documenting every droplet consumed. It's akin to Big Brother, but with a focus on water consumption. And here's the kicker. Supposedly, these regulations trace back to 1909. Nevertheless, they continue to evolve and become increasingly intricate over time. Consequently, it's not merely one farmer feeling the pressure. It's a plethora of small-scale farms and market gardens receiving the same ominous directive. Cease watering your crops. All because, according to the governing authorities, Irrigation fails to meet the criteria outlined in the exemption clause. Now, it's glaringly evident this amounts to nothing short of an outright assault on small-scale farming enterprises. I mean, seriously, categorizing a modest farmer with a handful of dairy cows and a simple milking station as a CAFO? That's utterly preposterous. These animals spend minimum time confined, grazing and being milked before returning to pasture. And let's discuss poultry and egg farming. Standard protocol involves keeping their feed indoors to maintain its dryness. But guess what? That could lead to legal repercussions too, courtesy of Oregon's liberal interpretation of regulations. Suddenly, they're swooping in, ordering individuals to shutter their chicken coops unless they shell out a substantial sum for infrastructure upgrades to manage wastewater from a diminutive 10 by 12 chicken enclosure. It represents one of the most flagrant power grabs we've witnessed thus far. And let's not delude ourselves. This isn't about safeguarding the environment or public health. It's about manipulating legislation to serve a particular agenda, plain and simple. Why else would they conveniently omit irrigation from the exemption clause, effectively shutting down numerous market gardens? It prompts the question, why the crackdown on agricultural cultivation in Oregon? And why target small-scale farmers with minute operations that produce negligible waste or runoff? This isn't about challenging influential dairy lobbyists. It's about steamrolling over individuals striving to earn an honest livelihood and nourish their communities. 
Tom Vilsack holds significant influence in the realm of dairy advocacy. This individual practically led the charge for the most prominent dairy farmer lobbying association. And who could overlook the infamous Got Milk Initiative? You know, the one where dairy farmers were digging into their pockets to support the cause, conveniently benefiting Vilsack in the process. Now, fast forward to the present day, and guess who's occupying the esteemed position of Secretary of Agriculture? You got it, Tom Vilsack. It's quite a convoluted situation, to say the least. Many dairy farmers felt trapped, compelled to contribute funds to initiatives that they may not have endorsed, but felt obliged to support if they wanted to market their milk. So one can't help but speculate. Did Vilsack's connections in the dairy industry play a role in advocating for these alterations? Perhaps they weren't keen on the notion of small-scale farms being viewed differently from CAFOs, perceiving it as unfair competition. And let's be honest, when it comes to engaging in underhanded tactics in agriculture, nothing is off-limits. It's a classic tale of the underdog facing insurmountable odds, with our small-scale farmers playing the role of David. At present, the scales are tipped against them, as they find themselves burdened with exorbitant infrastructure upgrade demands. We're talking about expecting them to invest a substantial sum just to remain operational. And here's the twist. It's a dual-pronged assault striking them from every direction. Initially, it was the market gardeners feeling the pinch last autumn, followed by the small dairy farmers at the onset of the year. And let me tell you, this legislation casts a wide net. It doesn't differentiate. It ensnares everyone, from egg and poultry producers to swine breeders and dairy goat caretakers. It's a sweeping measure that threatens to shutter any individual daring to cultivate their own sustenance. But here's the crux. These small-scale operations aren't even vying with the industry titans. They're simply striving to eke out a livelihood and nourish their communities. I highly doubt the larger farmers lose any sleep over these modest enterprises. But you can bet your bottom dollar that industry groups, lobbyists, and associations have a vested interest in keeping the little guys subdued. Now, it's a sobering realization. The very individuals elected to represent and safeguard the interests of Oregonians are the very ones implementing these policies with force, systematically dismantling not only a handful of farms, but entire livelihoods. I'm referring to the expulsion of over 25 market gardeners in a single sweep. Now, here's their method. They've established a hotline for vigilant neighbors to report anyone suspected of operating a market garden, vending vegetables, and accessing our valuable water reservoirs. Yes, we're discussing good old-fashioned informants. But if that intrusion isn't egregious enough, they've also resorted to satellite surveillance to monitor us from the skies. They'll detect a business license, a farm designation, and some crops flourishing on a parcel of land. And just like that, you're on their radar. It's genuinely unsettling, to say the least. We've had numerous conversations about it on the farm. I mean... Who wouldn't feel somewhat unsettled knowing that every year those satellite snapshots are refreshed, pinpointing every new structure and potentially leading to unanticipated property tax evaluations? It's akin to existing under a magnifying glass, with Big Brother maintaining a vigilant watch from above. Now we're witnessing a tale of two states, and the divergence couldn't be more pronounced. While Oregon is vigorously clamping down on small-scale farms, California is grappling with its own water crises, leaving 2,500 farmers parched due to drought-related restrictions. They're barely clinging on, with a mere 15% of their water allocation at their disposal. Now, this isn't a fresh narrative. It's an ongoing ordeal that unfolds repeatedly nationwide. Water entitlements and safeguards, once perceived as instruments for the collective welfare, are now wielded like a cudgel to extinguish farms from one coast to another. Consider the statistics. Since 2000, we've witnessed a staggering decline from 2.1 million farms to just under 1.9 million by the close of last year. And here's the punchline. The majority of these losses have transpired in the past four or five years alone. The pace at which we're hemorrhaging small farms is unparalleled. It's akin to witnessing the life force of our agricultural landscape dissipate right before our very eyes. And the justifications? They span from drought to, brace yourself, trout. Yes, you heard that correctly. Trout, not drought, is in some cases the culprit pushing farms to the brink. It's enough to provoke contemplation. Where will this all end, and who will endure when the dust finally settles? What's unfolding in Oregon amounts to a blatant power assertion, with authorities assuming control over individuals' wells, 
installing meters, and effectively disrupting small-scale farming operations, whether they involve dairy production, goat husbandry, or poultry keeping. And all of this is being justified under the pretense of protecting our invaluable groundwater. Now, don't misconstrue my stance. I'm all for environmental preservation. There's no denying that human activity has inflicted considerable harm upon our natural surroundings. However, let's be realistic here. I remain somewhat skeptical about the entire discourse surrounding global warming and CO2 emissions. Nevertheless, that doesn't mean I'm oblivious to the necessity of taking measures to ensure responsible land stewardship. From my vantage point, the majority of farmers I've encountered are deeply committed to conservation efforts. Take, for example, these market gardeners. They're not haphazardly squandering water resources. No. They're deeply immersed in the science of soil, diligently working to optimize moisture retention and minimize wastage. Compare that to the industrial giants, sprawling over hundreds of acres and indiscriminately deploying sprayers. It's a world of difference. These small-scale cultivators aren't recklessly depleting water reservoirs. They're utilizing it judiciously, nurturing their crops with meticulous care and precision. So I pose the question, who's truly squandering water here? The manner in which these individuals tend to their soil and cultivate their crops is truly commendable. Consider, for example, a small-scale dairy operator. Their livestock predominantly graze on open fields, indulging in verdant pastures for the majority of their lifetime. And let's not overlook the modest poultry farmer. Those birds roam freely, pecking and foraging to their heart's content. However, here's the crux of the matter. This enforcement isn't solely directed at cattle and poultry. It casts a wide net that could ensnare rabbit breeders as well. We've observed setups where rabbits are housed in concrete flooring, but provided with ample hay and a comfortable environment. Yet, according to regulatory authorities, even a small number of rabbits in such conditions could warrant a CAFO designation. It's utterly preposterous. But herein lies the crucial question. At what point does the government's noble pursuit of safeguarding the public interest veer into the realm of excessive intervention? When do their regulations cease to prioritize safety and instead transition into control? It's a precarious path, my friend, one that leaves individuals feeling as though their liberties are being encroached upon. Shouldn't individuals possess the autonomy to utilize their resources as they deem fit, free from intrusive oversight? It's about time we pose these challenging inquiries and demand accountability. The access to fresh, locally grown produce ought to be considered a fundamental human entitlement. However, the current situation unfolding in Oregon is nothing short of a tragedy. By extinguishing endeavors of small-scale farmers, they're essentially depriving every Oregon resident of that entitlement. And all under the guise of regulations initially intended to rein in large-scale operations and safeguard groundwater. It's a classic instance of distorting language and manipulating definitions to advance their agenda. And who bears the brunt of this? Well, it's individuals like you and me the ones reliant on these small farmers for access to farm-fresh produce and meats directly from the source. It's about time individuals opened their eyes to the reality of the situation. This isn't about safeguarding. It's about exerting authority. It's about eroding our liberties and our ability to access nourishing, wholesome sustenance. And make no mistake, other states are observing. They're observing closely and awaiting the outcome. And once the dust settles, you can be certain they'll swiftly follow suit. It's a familiar playbook. One state experiments with an intrusive policy, and if it goes unnoticed, it's merely a matter of time before others join in. It's a precarious path, one we cannot afford to descend. The ramifications of Oregon's stringent measures transcend geographical boundaries, foreshadowing a perilous precedent poised to permeate the nation. Let's be clear, this isn't solely about agriculture. It strikes at the core of our fundamental liberties. When governmental bodies begin dictating the parameters of land and water usage, it heralds a descent into authoritarianism. It represents a betrayal of the foundational tenets upon which our nation was established. Yet amidst the turmoil and ambiguity, there emerges a beacon of optimism. People are awakening to the harsh reality of the situation. They're standing in solidarity with these small-scale farmers, acknowledging them as the unsung heroes they truly are. These enterprises aren't mere economic entities. They serve as the lifeblood of our communities. They furnish us with sustenance, nourishment, and a profound connection to the land, a connection that's increasingly scarce in today's world. 
However, the battle is not yet won. It will require a unified effort to resist the intrusion of governmental overreach. We must rise up, voice our concerns, and advocate for change. It's imperative to hold our elected representatives accountable and remind them of their duty to the public. Moreover, let's not underestimate the influence of grassroots activism. Each dollar we spend serves as a ballot for the type of society we aspire to inhabit. By endorsing local farmers and enterprises, we're articulating a resolute stance against such injustices. Now let's explore what the government should be doing instead of implementing stringent measures that negatively impact small-scale farmers. Well, first and foremost, it's crucial for the government to engage in transparent and collaborative dialogue with stakeholders, including small farmers, environmental experts, and community members. By fostering an environment of open communication, the government can gain valuable insights into the challenges faced by small-scale farmers and work towards developing effective solutions that balance environmental conservation with agricultural sustainability. One approach the government could take is to provide financial incentives and support programs specifically tailored to small-scale farmers. This could include grants for implementing sustainable farming practices, subsidies for infrastructure upgrades to meet regulatory requirements, and technical assistance programs to help farmers navigate complex regulations and compliance procedures. By investing in the success of small-scale farmers, the government can ensure the continued viability of these important agricultural enterprises. Additionally, the government should explore alternative regulatory frameworks that prioritize risk-based assessments and flexibility for small-scale operations. Rather than applying one-size-fits-all regulations that disproportionately burden small farmers, regulators should take into account the scale and scope of each operation and tailor regulations accordingly. This could involve implementing tiered regulatory systems based on farm size and production volume, with smaller farms subject to less stringent requirements. Furthermore, the government should actively promote and support local food systems that prioritize the production and distribution of locally grown and sustainable food. This could involve initiatives such as farm-to-school programs, farmer's markets, and community-supported agriculture, or CSA programs, that connect consumers directly with local farmers. By strengthening local food systems, the government can create new market opportunities for small-scale farmers and increase access to fresh, healthy food for communities. Another important aspect is to invest in research and innovation to develop new technologies and practices that support sustainable agriculture. This could include funding for research on soil health, water conservation, and crop resilience, as well as the development of new farming methods such as agroecology and regenerative agriculture. By harnessing the power of innovation, the government can help small-scale farmers adapt to changing environmental conditions and improve the long-term sustainability of their operations. In addition to supporting small-scale farmers, the government should also prioritize environmental conservation and protection of natural resources. This could involve implementing policies and incentives to promote conservation practices such as crop covering, rotational grazing, and agroforestry, which can help sequester carbon, reduce erosion, and improve soil health. By investing in conservation efforts, the government can mitigate the environmental impact of agriculture and ensure the long-term health of ecosystems and biodiversity. Furthermore, the government should prioritize access to clean and safe water for all communities, including rural areas served by small-scale farmers. This could involve investments in water infrastructure, watershed management, and pollution prevention measures to ensure that water resources are protected and available for agricultural use. By addressing water challenges, the government can support the sustainability of agriculture while safeguarding public health and environmental quality. Additionally, the government should prioritize education and outreach initiatives to raise awareness about the importance of supporting small-scale farmers and sustainable agriculture. This could involve public campaigns, workshops, and training programs for farmers, consumers, and policymakers to promote understanding of the benefits of small-scale farming practices and the role they play in promoting environmental stewardship and community resilience. Moreover, the government should explore opportunities for collaboration and partnership between small-scale farmers and other stakeholders, including local businesses, nonprofit organizations, and academic institutions. By fostering collaboration, the government can leverage the collective expertise and resources of diverse stakeholders to address common challenges and develop intuitive solutions that benefit small-scale farmers and the broader community. 
Furthermore, the government should prioritize equity and social justice in its agricultural policies and programs. This includes addressing historical inequalities and disparities in access to resources and opportunities for small-scale farmers, particularly those from marginalized communities. By promoting equity and inclusion, the government can ensure that all farmers have the support they need to succeed and thrive in the agricultural sector. So what are your thoughts on this new law? Please let us know in the comment section below. Like the video if you found it helpful, and share it with others to do your part. Thank you.